Hi, everyone. Uh, good to see everyone here. And uh, I'll give a quick talk, because I know I'm sitting in front of some of your meals, some of your drinks, and whatnot. Um, and you see up there, I'm saying, talking about a revolution. I'll get back to that in a minute. Is this thing moving? I never seem to. All right. First, first and foremost, um, thank you, everybody. I mean, this is an amazing event, as well as an amazing outcome to a journey, at least on my end, that started in 2008. And I could never have predicted, although there was a wonderful vision of we could bring clinical data and genomic data and discover new things if we could just solve the problems of sharing information inside of J&J, &J, and couldn't we take it to the world? How could I have thought that we would have had someone like Keith Elliston, founder of Genstruct, helped assemble the genome, <laughs> you know, have folks from all sorts of organizations like you know Julie, who came from uh, Gingo, and and have organized groups from all of the groups that have been nice enough to fund the work we did to deliver systems at places like Janssen and Sanofi and Pfizer and Millennium, and there's others. <laughs> um, and you're still here, which doesn't always happen with these big software projects. And so, you know. A huge thank you, you know, to people like E.K., who, who was a founder of Infrasense, a major informatics company who then moved on and is, is driving an open source project out of the UK. And for groups like K's, who came on board as a nice upstart software entrepreneur to build up a big team. So I'm, I feel like I'm living this wonderful dream outcome of what started as a small software project. And it's so amazing to see all of your contributions, continuing to move this forward. And I do predict continued great success for all of us, because what I see in the room is a tremendous amount of talent, commitment, progress. I mean, not to mention, you know, Dr. Paul Aviak, who is in his plenary thing today, showed an amazing version of I2B2 and Transmart and things that he's done, and bridging the gap to my former colleagues like Zach and Sean Murphy, to make something work where I2B2 and Transmart will live in harmony for a good deal of future to go on. So it's been an honor to work with all of you, and that's one of the reasons why Deloitte continues to be a sponsor of the Transmart Foundation and of this project. We do benefit from it. We benefit from having a very strong capability that we can deliver to new customers. Um, if you look at Deloitte, we're one of the Largest consultancies, in fact, we are the largest professional services company in the world. And the largest part of Deloitte's professional services organization is the healthcare life sciences practice. And that means we bring together in, I'll say, billions of dollars worth of consulting services into life sciences groups, health plans, providers, and the government, as well as working outside with foreign countries, places in China, Germany, the Netherlands. So we have this unique opportunity in Deloitte that allows us to bring these stakeholders together in a time which is unique in history. And it's unique because here in the United States, at least, we're seeing tremendous convergence amongst health plans and providers, tremendous jumps in terms of the availability of assays, genomic or otherwise. And all of it is driving change which should lead to a new form of medicine. But I'll go back to uh, my favorite revolution, um, the Industrial Revolution. And so there's, a, there's a really good book um, that, that um, goes over the history of the invention of the locomotive. And it all began with the steam engine. And it came out in about 1705. And I'll talk about it for a second. But the, the important thing to note is the Industrial Revolution shot off like a rocket once they had solved some of the basic issues of how to build a steam engine. But it also shot off like a rocket because they solved the problematic governance issues of how to have property ownership. Those are two big things that launched it. So if you want to read the book, the book is called The Most Powerful Idea in the World, A Story of Steam Industry and Invention. And I feel like we're somewhere near here. And maybe we've invented I2B2, which was this really crummy steam engine. Not to say it's bad, but it didn't do that much. It gave you a cohort count. And we're getting further along where we've built a commercial engine where some people have really installed and got these things running. And now we're starting to move into 
solving real problems. But if you look into the history of the steam engine, it became the locomotive over time moving from a motion that looked like this, a little tilting motion to a circular motion. That took about 100 years. Um, but by doing that, they could run mills. They could move forward with all of manufacturing. And eventually, they could run trains and move things around the world. But it started here. Um, and it was invented in particular to solve a specific problem. And the problem was this. They had mines. And people wanted to keep themselves warm and pull coal out of the ground to keep themselves warm. Pretty important thing back in the day. It was cold out. But if you dug deep enough in the mine, you couldn't go much further before you hit water. And the water would cover all the coal. In order to get the coal out of the mine, you had to pull the water up. What could you use to pull the water up? Coal and water. You could boil the water up here in the steam engine, tilt this thing up and down, pull the water up, and then dig up the rest of the coal. Well, we have some modern problems in healthcare. Our coal at the bottom of that well is a lot of things. It's us, people. It's our health. It's the waste we have in the world that stops us from being healthy. So we are spending $700 billion extra that we shouldn't be here in the United States. We have all these drugs that we offer to patients that have marginal efficacy. And we have a lot of cases, as Paul presented today, where we can't really even stratify the diseases like autism. There's a lot of coal at the bottom of our well. But we have the chance here, and we have started, to invent what is the future to bring that coal out of the well. Now, Transmart's just a piece of it. Um, but that future is taking the data, and the data about us, about patients, gen genetics about patients, clinical phenotypes, what the drugs we're treated with, and figure out how we can make this really work so that patients get the care that they deserve, and we live healthier, happier, longer lives. We're down here again. You know, we, 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 how much data did we talk about sharing today? There's this need for this exponential growth that we have yet to get to, but we will get to, I'm pretty sure. We're at the beginning of. That's Moore's Law right there. That's our microprocessors. And we've seen some exponential growth. In fact, there are some guys that we partner with at Deloitte called Singularity University that are tracking things that are growing in exponential growth. I'm going to a conference in early November just focusing on exponential medicine. And you can see we do have exponential growth in genetics, right? That's the growth of the number of base pairs in GenBank. But there's no row here for shared data sets. There's no row here for Paula, Viox, GPS, patient base, patients we actually know a lot of things about that we can finally analyze. But we're going to get there, but we're here. And we're, we're building the systems of the future that will help us to get there with tools like I2B2 and Transmart and the federation tools that you're seeing on top of it. A big thing we're noting is that the result is there's a convergence coming between what we've been calling real world evidence and what we've been calling precision medicine. But ultimately, it's everything about a patient is coming together. And groups in our world, in Deloitte's universe, are asking us to bring all that data sets together in solutions that are a little broader than just the Transmart system. And so we're working to deliver those kinds of systems. Now I'll show you really quickly something that we've been building that has nothing to do with genetics, has nothing to do with clinical data. It does have a lot to do with predicting things we wouldn't normally see. Um, and this is the lifestyle-based analytics data that we work with in our health plans practice. And we work with it to track the 2,000 fields on every, universe, and every individual that get pulled from marketing data sets. And by taking those data sets from an insurer and matching them up against the patients that are in their insurance database, we can build predictions, just like we want to do with our genomics, of what kind of conditions a patient can have and build a view of an entire market. So for an example, here I am a very happy married man. I have three kids. Um, and my risk of depression, obviously we could predict depression or diabetes or anything else. But then we go forward, and unfortunately, my wife divorced me, went bankrupt. She got the house. I recently changed. And there goes my depression index. And so there's other information about might, might affect our health 
than just the things we're looking at. Uh oh. And then finally, I might actually do some strange things like start listening to acid rock or maybe stop buying my home improvement thing or just stop paying attention to investments altogether and have risk of depression at 36%. And I only bring this up to say, you know, there's a lot of information out there that, that's important that goes outside of the clinical domain and that we continue as a group to try and bring together what we know as humans to help do things like this, which is using that model to predict disease prevalence throughout Michigan, which was used in this case for the health information exchange to figure out how to price health plans for the risk of all the patients in the system. We work with folks like Brent James at Intermountain Healthcare, and we've been trying to build out a consortium. And I bring it up with this group because there's this continuing need to get access to real clinical data from life sciences companies. And the two things that Deloitte's done to try and bring this sort of solution together is first, built our own consortium on the back end of Intermountain, Regenstrief, and Moffitt. But also, we're starting to see life sciences companies build therapeutic area specific private networks. And those are for areas, in our case, in immunology. Um, there's another one in the case of uh, infectious disease. And we're gonna continue to see pockets of funded groups that are gonna collect big data sets, large populations across multiple health systems, and put them into a system, like Transmart in our case, to be able to build out the analytics that you can use to get insights on those populations. We've been building reference architectures for our clients. This is an example of a reference architecture. And in almost all the reference architectures we're building, we're putting Transmart in one of the boxes. And the purpose in our case is to take a solution for a group that has a specific set of problems, whether it's an academic medical center, it's a life sciences company, or you know, it's good that, that Ken is here and I'm so happy that, that Michael J. Fox is joining. It's a nonprofit where we can look at where Transmart will fit within that architecture. So we can accelerate adoption from groups and not have to have them spend all their time trying to figure out where does a CTMS like Cal's Open Clinica fit into the open source world or the commercial world for fitting together a nonprofit's blueprint for how to run their operations to do discovery research. You know, we have still been doing Transmart work, the kind of things we've done recently. Here's quick screens from a project we did at NIAD relating to uh, a disease most people know as elephantiasis, but it's ringworms that infect some people and give um, a very extreme uh, lymph expansion. But looking at things in their case to either see expanded views through visualization tools that are outside of the Transmart environment or to look at a detail level at individual patient records so that they can review full patient histories. And so we haven't stopped trying to innovate and add new features and functions to Transmart, but we do believe, and, and I believe personally, that the way we move things forward is we do development based upon real science needs, and we expand the platform, and hopefully we also expand the core APIs to meet the needs of the services that have to be provided out to the scientists who can help us to move that coal, which is all that opportunity and all that life we can extend and make better by treating diseases better. So the last thing we've learned, unfortunately, is we have a lot of data, but data does not equal information. We can't just use the data in its raw form. We struggle with it all day, and you hear about all of our curation problems. Just because we've curated data doesn't mean we've made a discovery. It does not translate directly to insight. That requires the scientists we work with to be engaged. It requires us to work hard to have the type of people who can encourage adoption that we employ on our team, and I think others also employ on their teams to get work done. And probably more importantly, just because we know how things work a little bit better, there's still an added step before we can take action and change how patients are treated and change the overall workflow for how medicine's provided. So, you know, the quick summary from the Deloitte side is, um, we do love the Transmart community. I personally have very much enjoyed working with everybody and hope to have continued meetings like this in the future. And I really don't want to get in the way of you guys drinking. Thanks. <laughs>